Well, hello and welcome back, everybody. I'm Dan John from danjohnuniversity.com. Each and every week I sit down here and I answer your questions on our podcast. Today is episode 184, which amazes me, of course, and I'm happy to be here. Um, if you have questions, you send them in to me at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. I'm smiling a little bit when I say that because one of our comments said that when I say that, I remind them of Sister Michael on the show Dairy Girls, which is kind of a funny story because uh, my mom died in 1980. And my daughters, especially my daughter Kelly, uh, is very fascinated by her. And uh, But when the show Dairy Girls came out, the first night I'm watching it, it's like, oh my God, that's my mom. Uh, Sister Michael reminds me a lot of mom with that, oh, that uh, that devastating Northern Irish wit, uh, that great sarcasm, that uh, the, the eye rolls, the whole thing, that's my mom. And so it was kind of, it's kind of funny. So thank you, uh, gentle listeners. And I really do appreciate the comments when they're nice and appropriate. Uh, when you call me out for my physical problems or the fact that I say things stupid, some uh, n not stupid, uh, I stutter or have a speech impediment. Uh, I don't know, kind of hurts my feelings a little bit because, you know, getting over that was a hard thing to overcome. But here we are. Now, listen, um, when you're getting this, uh, we'll probably open it up another inner circle pretty soon. So if you're interested, uh, I, I would like that uh, that you go to danjohninnercircle.com to apply for the next group. We don't keep very many people, about 10 to 15. And uh, I, I think Brian and Ozzy like people to register early on this. Uh, it, it certainly, if you, so if you want to be part of it, danjohninnercircle.com. A uh, little reminder, I'm very proud of this, but my Easy Strength Omni book is out. Um, it's, it's a very good book. Uh, it doesn't seem to be very popular. Uh, and that's just what happens. But if you'd like a copy of it, go to easystrengthomnibook.com and you'll find it there. Uh, also, too, there's a link on the site at Dan John University. And if you really struggle, you can't find it, you know, make a note here and we'll, we'll do our best. On, uh, it's on, I think it's already on the YouTube section, but, you know, we'll add it anyway, okay? But thank you. Another thing is a lot of people have been asking me, to do more interviews. I had that fun one with Brett Contreras. But if you have ideas of people you'd like me to, to interview, uh, let me know. Uh, either make a note of it at the forum at Dan John University. Um, sometimes here in the show notes, uh, you, you know, I mean, it's gonna be real hard for me to have, you know, Abraham Lincoln and Gandhi. Uh, I know I'm exaggerating here, but sometimes people ask for me to bring people on. That's, that's just really difficult. Uh, I mean, I do have that wonderful picture of my brother uh, who became friends with Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, during the terrible Paradise Fire, which, of course, if you know what happened, my, my brother died. And uh, if you see the National Geographic uh, special on rebuilding Paradise, about the last third of the video is my brother's funeral, which is an amazing thing. Um, I mean, I'd love to get Arnold. I, you know but it'd be a little difficult. And I'm sure there's a lot of other really hyper-famous people, but you know, uh, in my world, if there's someone you like, and I wouldn't even mind if it was someone I didn't even know very well, but if I can get contact information, that helps even more. Um, I, I, actually, there's a couple of you who post I'd like to interview you. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, a few of the people I'd like to police with me when I interview you. <laughs> that was funny. Oh, I'm trying something new today too. I'm putting the questions that I get on paper because I don't like look. I have to constantly keep refreshing my computer, you know, tapping it and keep it on while I do this. Well, we're going to start right off. Now, Nicholas asks a very long question, but and, and don't take this wrong, Nicholas. And by the way, I love the work you do every year on Christmas. Um, I hope you get the joke. Uh, it, it's a long question. He talks about me, he's, uh, about how I, I really emphasize the overhead press. And and really, I just decided, and Nicholas, I like your question, but I, I wanna just do this, okay? Let's do this. Why is the military press better than the bench press? Well, first, it's not. 
a press is a press, there's great value to it. My concern has been, and I fell into it too, is that in most people, when they lift, it's the bench press. Uh, the bench press, you can trick uh, the numbers up and you can get a more impressive bench press. Um, you can do a lot of little things like, you know, you, you can certainly bounce an arch like you see at most gyms. Uh, you can <laughs> you can have your spotter deadlift the weight off of you. I, I like the bench press. Sure. I, in fact, I had a great love affair with it in my in my youth. Um, one of the things that happens, though, is like any exercise, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then there's like a topping out point. For me, I think that, you know, getting your bench press over 400 pounds, and this comes from Tom Fahey, my good friend, uh, the great uh, the great professor at Chico State University and really wise guy. He, he told me, you know, that for my needs, getting around a 400 pound bench is all I'd never need, all I'd ever need. And he had the other numbers for me. He said a 250 snatch, a 300 clean, and a 450 back squat. Now, these numbers are all, I, mean, I hate to say it, but ridiculously low. But his point, and it's the point I emphasize a lot, if you hit those numbers as a discus thrower and you're not throwing far, your problems aren't going to be fixed in the gym. You've got to get out there and fix the problems you're having out there in the ring or on the field of play or the court, the pitch or whatever you're doing. My knock then on the bench press is that people will continue to try to add more and more and more load to the bench press, even if it starts to bounce, you know, this little bench press area right here. Uh, Dick Knott might used to push it in the day after I bench just to give me that, that pain, that whatever that little magic area where all the bench press pain comes from. Um, you, you tend to top out. Now, one of the reasons most people hate the overhead press family, and I'm just going to call it the military press for the rest of this time. And I've heard people argue about whether it's called overhead press or military. Oh, come on now. You have a weight here and you push it over your head. There, you're welcome. That's what I'm going to call that a military press. One of the issues with the military press, and I tell you, it's a tough one, is any improvement in the military press seems to take a lot of work and a lot of time. And that's an issue. You know, you can... You can cheat your way to a bigger squat and a bigger bench press with all kinds of equipment changes, all kinds of small things like that. Uh, you can go shallow on it on both on both movements. You can go a little bit shallower. Oh, you can have your spotters pick up most of the weight for you. And it's hard to trick the deadlift, but some people say there are tricks. Real hard. For, I don't know a lot of a lot of tricks to the Olympic lifts besides you know improving your technique and. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> being born with superior genetics. But with the military press, if you're pressing 135 pounds, getting to 140, uh, if you're pressing 60 kilos and you want to get up to 65, that's a bigger jump, but just follow the point. That often is very difficult to do. Whereas in the bench press, the difference between a 275 bench press and a 280 you won't you won't really feel much of a difference, um, but in the military you will. I like the military press for the same reasons I like uh, the Olympic lifts and the full body movements. I I like a lift where your entire body has to be engaged when you do it. Now I know the hands going to go. That's true in the bench press too. I, and I know at an elite level, you know your ankles are part of the lift. I, I get that. But when I do a military press, the bar is on the ground. I have to clean it. I have to get myself in a good position. I lock it up and I have to keep my glutes tight, my thighs tight, my calves tight. I have to grab the ground with my feet. I have to build a platform for my body to support that weight. Um, there's a weird little sticking point we all get kind of depending on how you're built. It's either here or here or here or, or you know, any other degrees too. Uh, if, if you do a lot of military presses, uh, one thing I do like about someone who military presses three days a week is that you do weirdly see their shoulders, their whole shoulders. <laughs> we joke in my gym whenever I press that my shoulders are so wide, I can't get through my garage door anymore. Uh, barnyard wide shoulders. That's what they used to say back in the fifties and sixties and, uh, boulders for deltoids and all that. But I notice when I military press and 
you know, and I hate the question, but if you're going to ask me, what would be the, if you could only do one lift to look good, the lift for me would probably be the overhead press family, the military press or any of the kettlebell presses and dumbbell presses that go overhead. I think it does wonders for your whole, the whole way you look. Um, it's real hard to be a big military presser with, and not have whole body tension, which is of course one of the things you need to pick up on as you train at higher and higher levels. Is the bench press bad? No, and I would never say that. Is the bench press often overdone? Yeah, I think so. Um, and if you just want to do a short-term experiment, um, uh, Nicholas, I mean, you might want to do just a month, you know, three days a week of military presses, and then an interesting thing will happen at the end of that month when you go back to bench press. It might take a day, and then depending on how you're built, I mean, for me, it would... It doesn't take me long to pick, pick another exercise back up. It might take you a day or two to get your bench press back in the groove, but I can almost guarantee a month of military presses, three days a week, 12 workouts, uh, is gonna do wonders for all your lifts. There is something special about cleaning your body weight and then pressing it overhead that just can't be replicated by doing, like benching your body weight I mean, it's very doable. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some of our listeners probably did it the first day, the first week they ever bench pressed. Uh, but clean and pressing overhead your 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 body weight, that's 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 a good lift. You know, like I was told, you know, very young, that if you could press, uh, clean and press, and snatch your body weight, you were recognized universally as being strong, as being a pretty put together person. There is a one or two other issues. Now, this one, let me just do this one first. When it comes to how you look, I've never been a fan of huge pecs uh, on men. Uh, and, and this could just be because of my own experience. When I used to do a lot of bench presses, I used to notice I began to, to turn in a little bit. Um, the big pec, sometimes you don't see the posture with it. I know. Every single person out there, not me, not me, I know, but I did and some other people I know. But when you military press, almost universally, your posture looks good. So as you just walk around in street clothes, you look kind of good in street clothes. Uh, whereas when you kind of bench press, you know, in street clothes, some, some guys don't look very good who are good benchers. Again, that's just vanity, but... It's just something to consider. I, it's just a uh, just a look. Um, the other thing I do like about the military over the bench press, and this we'll, we'll summarize it here, is that people do get that bench press shoulder. Uh, you also get that push up shoulder. It's just, it's just like the pull up elbow, the elbow uh, issues from excessive pull ups or uh, trying too hard, uh, working through failure on pull ups. Um, there is a weird bench press shoulder. Some people get it. If you if you bench press for two years and haven't thrown a, a baseball or any other ball, and then you, you go out on a, I don't know, picnic and decide to play a game of baseball and you make a hard throw, that might be the last throw you make for months because you'll get that, that little weird joint I issue up here you get from uh, bench pressing followed by throwing balls fast. I don't think you get that with military, at least I haven't. So I never like to be either or on things, but I, I'm a big fan of the military press. And I certainly think that the bench press has its place. But let me just say this to some, I like the military better. Uh, the fact that you don't see it done very often, um, the fact that you don't see it done very often it's probably because it's a lot harder to do a military press. And uh, most people I've seen in the gyms don't like to do anything that's hard. They like to walk on treadmills, you know, tapping their phone, but it doesn't look like they like to w work very hard. Uh, Nicholas, I hope you don't mind me uh, summarizing your answer that way, but I, I thought there was some value to it. Okay, we've got a question from Habib, and Habib says this. He, I, I did a little thing about wrestling conditioning. Now, remember, if the best book, one of my favorite books, and I want to turn here and see it, but I 
think I might have loaned it out again because I'm an idiot, which means I have to buy another copy. John Jesse's uh, Wrestling uh, Conditioning Encyclopedia. Just an amazing book. I mean, everything you think was invented recently, no, it was written. It's in John Jesse's book. Uh, that's where I would go to get a, a nice overview of the things you should do as a wrestler. Uh, I get most of my information from the old strength and health articles I have up there. Um, but in the it, Habib asks this question, why did you recommend the clean and press, snatch, clean and jerk, loaded carries for smart off-season weight training? Um, I recommended it because I am still convinced on the very first article, the, the very first strength and health magazine I ever bought had an article about high school wrestling, and the coach said a very interesting thing. Uh, if you can snatch, uh, if you can snatch your body weight when you're going against your opponent, you literally know that you can pick them up and whip them over your head. Uh, I've never done that, but there is a little bit. So the Olympic lifts, I think, reflect the kind of strength you need to be a wrestler. Now, obviously, wrestlers do all kinds of things. Um, I, uh, and the, I know that the Olympic lifts are, especially the clean, with the clean and press, which was taken out of the Olympics in 1972. They're, they're not as popular as they were when I was young, but I still think those three lifts, if that's all you did, you'd be just fine. Now, in the loaded carries, of course, I believe that loaded carries increase work capacity, and it's that weird kind of work capacity. It's sometimes we call it dad strength. Uh, you know, the old joke about when I was growing up, we were all lifting weights, and Dad would ask us to help, you know, take the engine out of the car. And, you know, we'd all, you know, get all, we're all doing our push-ups and all our nonsense. And, you know, Dad would reach in there, the Chrysler, and pull the engine out by himself, you know. And, you know, when you couldn't open a, a, a jar or a bottle or something, Dad would rip that thing open. That's Dad's strength or farmer strength to hear. Uh, the farmer carry, the farmer walk, uh, bear hug carries with the big bags. See, to me, I think that's the kind of condition you want to do. Now, people are going to ask about more specifics. Uh, I'm not a big fan of specific lifting for sports. Uh, now, I certainly, we do it with my throwers. We have some things we do. But it's a very nuanced thing, and it's not something that would be easy to explain in a podcast. It's one of those things that's like, I'm getting these uh, javelin uh, video exercises sent to me by my friend Brian. And I'm glad he's not typing up what the exercise is. He's just showing me the video, you know, of this exercise. Because I don't know how you would ever be able to write that much. So when it comes to, like, specificity, when it comes to a sport like wrestling, yeah, I'm sure there's real value in having, you know, those those heavy bags and, you know, throw those around, do Turkish get-ups with those bags. Uh, um, you know, you do the lift and throws with the bags. You do all that stuff. I know there's great value to it. Real hard to explain outside of a gym. Uh, the other thing too, uh, I did wrestle. In fact, I I was just showing a friend of mine a picture of me uh, pinning someone in high school. I'm pinning the Jefferson uh, kid. And his counter was to stick his hand into my face like this. And when the referee hit pin, my nose broke and I bled all, all over the guy. So that was a, but you can see my nose. My nose is about over here. And you'll notice it never did really get fixed. I did it. Um, I did wrestle. Uh, when I wrestled, our, our weight lifting program was circuit training on a universal gym. And I thought that was pretty darn good. Um, I would like to have wrestled after I started doing the Olympic lifts because uh, I just loved how explosive I was all the time. I'd say the biggest bang for your buck if you're going to be a wrestler is the Olympic lifts if, uh, as appropriate. You're going to have to learn them young because uh, most wrestlers have all kinds of injuries. And really, you know, when you're when you're with, you know, good wrestlers, um, you begin to notice certain things. You notice the ears, you notice the face, you notice the hands, you notice the, you know, there's, there's a lot of injuries in these combat sports, even something like our American wrestling. Uh, so that, yeah, that's why. Uh, it's a it's a good question. Uh, it's a good question to review. Um, I get questions now about how to train for boxing, how to train for wrestling. 
It's like something I read when I was very, very young about a certain job that you'll see in certain cities and the, the gentleman wear a certain style of clothes and drive a certain kind of vehicle. And someone wanted to be one of them when he grew up. And, and the, the thing said, you know, this sometimes you just, you don't learn everything in school. You have to learn sometimes. You have to learn things on the streets. Um, I think if you're an elite uh, wrestler uh, looking for information from this podcast, I, I must say, and there's no humility here. It's just honest. Uh, I'm giving some general advice to some general questions. Um, when I work with, you know, top end athletes, um, you know, there, there's always a thousand factors you have to keep juggling. Um, I, I hope that answers your question. Um, but when, when you, for those of you who are going to start working with a school team, uh, yeah, I get those, I would get your athletes doing at least power clean military press and front squat as soon as you can in your, in your program because you want to beat those injuries. Once the elbows and wrists start getting beaten up from the sports, the fingers, uh, maybe the knees, and some, and sometimes um, it's gonna be real hard to teach the Olympic lifts or those full body movements after. So yeah, it's, that's a good question. Uh, thank you very much, I enjoyed that. We have a question from Steven. He says, how close can the Zercher carry and or kettlebell rack carry get to the bear hug carry with a heavy sandbag? Well, I mean, I, okay, I, I, I mean, anybody does a Zercher carry, that's where you carry the weight in your elbows. I mean, you're, you're pretty much, everything else is going to be pretty easy after that. Um, it's interesting though, I do like your little combination here. So the rack carries, the Zercher carry, and the bear hug carry, yeah, they're going to be in that same little family, aren't they, Stephen? Yeah, that I, I would say you're close enough, okay? You're close enough. Um, but your follow-up question is something I, I wish I'd have thought of before. Do you know if snatch grip barbell carries could have benefit? Back front rack carries. Now, we did, uh, back when Ben and I did the video called Carry It Away, uh, we did, uh, at the time, we used to do a lot of front squat rack barbell rack carries that was common back then uh because i had a squat rack in uh <laughs> i mean what do you even call that thing the alleyway the it was next to a river i had a squat rack back there we would do a lot of squat uh back squat carries um uh with chains uh, because i liked how the chains uh dragged uh, on the ground i thought that was really valuable uh to to add more uh well, it added resistance, you know, you, you dragged them. Um, I like them a lot. The, the issue with front and back uh, carries is getting the load here. So if you have a squat rack, you're fine. You can step out, but you know, you're going to have to be in a situation. You're going to have to have a, I would suggest a freestanding squat rack. You take it outside or wherever you're going to do it. And then, you know, you step back and you go, you go walk. Um, I would be very concerned and it's not, I'm not a safety crazy or anything but there's a lot of racks i've seen that would not be very safe to walk all the way out and then doo -doo -doo. most gyms i know there's no place to walk inside the gym so you're just going to fall into the issue with um, making it work that's just and really it's there's a few listeners right now going i've got i can do that in my gym no problem and there's others going yeah there's no way i can do that your snatch grip deadlift question is a good one. See, we tried the deadlift carry. In fact, there's value to it. Uh, there is value, especially when you're working with uh, Olympic hammer throwers. So the ball throwers, uh, Highland gamers too. Walking this way and fighting this, the the the, the body is trying to, you know, it's, it's gravity. You're, you're sliding this way. There's real value on that that work capacity counter to it. Uh, the problem is it really is is hard because it it just sits there on your thighs, so you're walking and banging your thighs. But your idea about a snatch grip now that's that's something I didn't think about. Uh, my thought on it just and I haven't done it would be the grip. Okay, the snatch grip itself would be hard would be hard to hold on to, uh, and then of course if you use straps, then you've kind of 
eliminate it. One thing you probably would find about that with the snatch grip is you're going to have a real interesting way of being tall as you do it. Because the snatch grip, when you when you do any kind of drill with a snatch grip, or Romanian deadlift, or whatever, you know, you're going to be back here like that. It might be something worth doing. I'm going to ask you to try it, and then, uh, yeah, do it, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we got a question from Ronan. Ronan, excellent. I was reading through your latest Easy Strength book this Christmas. Thank you. EasyStrengthOmnibook.com. I won't harp on too much, but I absolutely devoured it and have read it several times now. It's excellent. Thank you very much. He also notes waiting for the hard copy. Uh, we're just, it takes a while and it, it is harder and harder to produce hard to a printed work. It, it just is. Uh, we're doing our best, uh, but, uh, and it, of course, by the time you hear this, it might be done. I was reading over your easy hypertrophy discussion, in particular, the bit about selecting exercises that don't stress the grip. So for those of you too cheap to buy my uh, book, um, I, I have this idea. It's just an idea, just an insight that exercises that seem to really help on hypertrophy tend to be a little easier on the grip. And I think it goes back to the way we're built. Homoculus man, look look up homoculus man. You'll notice the hands and the feet and the eyes are massive. So I have this theory that when you have an exercise that really taxes your grip, it tends to um, it, it tends to be less of a hypertrophy exercise. You know, back squats are wonderful for hypertrophy, but really all you're doing, you know, especially if you're doing high rep squats, which I recommend, and anybody else who's ever had success doing, high, you know, with back squat, squats or mass, um, you, you barely even hold on. Another exercise, and this comes from my friend Brian, for hypertrophy is the handstand pull-ups. I'm like, uh, uh, pardon me, handstand press-ups, handstand press-ups. And then I thought about it, and again, you even though your hand's on the ground, you're not gripping. And then I thought about why dips, if you can do dips, why they seem to be so good for hypertrophy is that even, yeah, you're holding on to a bar, but it's fair um, the, to the to the stands, but it's a very relaxed grip versus say a, a pull or a, a pull up or a deadlift. Interesting stuff. Um, I would like to throw in the suggestion here for a pulling exercise that does not use the hands pullovers. If you ever read John McCallum's the complete keys to progress, of course I have. Or Kelso's Powerlifting Basics, Texas style. Uh, I still, one of my favorite parts of the book is his, his cheerleader program because the basic that's just easy strength. Um, all bulking routines uh, include this exercise. They were my favorite part of super squats because I got to lie down after 20 minutes. Um, this is, yeah, Ronan, this is a good, this is a good point. I, the reason people used to do pullovers was this idea, and I don't, I still don't know if it's true or false, but the, there was this idea that you wanted to expand your rib cage. Uh, Bob Hoffman was a real believer. He was the guy who basically, I can't remember if he started York itself or bought it and kept the name, but get close enough. So basically, you know, York Barbell, Strength and Health Magazine, Muscular Development Magazine. He wrote a lot of books, uh, some some, they look like he just you know, wrote them very quickly. But one of the things he believed in, it was that you wanted to expand your rib cage so that you look bigger. And, I, and the big rib cage, you'll notice a lot of guys back in the 50s when they would do, they would always do this big rib cage push. Um, it's not as big anymore. I don't that's, I haven't heard expanding a rib cage in years. But the pullover exercise, you know, you're laying on the bench and your arms go free here. Um, I know javelin throwers love it. Uh, there is a need for some mobility to do it. You better have good shoulders. And, uh, yeah, I, I think there is value to that. In the Easy Strength Omnibook, easystrengthomnibook.com, um, <laughs> I do discuss this kind of concept called easy hypertrophy. And I even come up with a few simple programs. I mean, if you want an absolutely minimalist program and your sternum can handle it, 
a lot of people get sternum issues when they do dips. Maybe not you, but a lot of people do, mostly teenagers. But if you just did, you know, dips and high rep back squats, you know, you, I mean, it's not perfect, but it's not bad. Uh, if you took them really seriously, you know, um, do my mass made simple program and just drop everything else and just do keep the high rep squats image and just do, you know, dips, you'd probably be okay. And you'd probably have some in interesting recoveries. Uh, it's, I think, two or three chapters in the book. I, I, I think, Ronan, uh, this is one of those strange things where, uh, you know, you write a book and all of a sudden it's like, wait a second, what was that all about? Um, but yeah, I, I like your, I, I, I like this question and I hope that if you, if you do try something like this, um, a, kind of an easy hypertrophy approach, I think if you added the the pullovers after the squats, I, it's a classic idea. Whether it does what it said it did, I, I don't know. I, I um, It's one of those things where I've, I've read a lot of books. I don't have my Bob Hoffman books anymore. I, I, I donated those uh, to a library. Um, but, uh, you know, he, he's real. Oh, there's one right there, <laughs> except for that one. But uh, that was a real big thing. But that was that was the generation of lifters just before me. Um, one of the things I think, and this is just a small little point. Sometimes, uh, so I'm 65 as I'm as I'm reading this today. Um, I started lifting weights when I was, what, eight, I guess? Yeah, 1965. So, and then I started reading magazines and stuff uh, and bodybuilding books and weightlifting books probably not long after that, 67, uh, after that. Um, so already, uh, like for example, when I first started reading Strength and Health, there was already these big controversies over, well, obviously amphetamines and anab uh, anabolics, but also to whether or not they should keep the military press. They did not. Um, this rising sport called powerlifting, um, uh, and the big, the big chest, the pullover era was kind of not, it was kind of dying out or done by the time I came up. Interesting, uh, just before I showed up on the scene, people were still doing, uh, dumbbell swings and snatches, uh, a lot for conditioning. And that kind of ended probably when I first started touching weights, probably 62 to 65. They, a lot of these great exercises just disappear. And if you really want to make uh, a name for yourself, just go get a bunch of old bodybuilding magazines and flip through them and just steal what they did that's been lost and, you know, start your own company and, you know, sell pieces of equipment that, have, you know, didn't do anything for you back then and probably won't any, anymore. Uh, I'm going to start my own vibration belt company. Remember those old things you see in movies sometimes that, they jiggle the fat out of you um, because, you know, I have a cert for that, you know, the fat jiggling cert. We'll go for three days and just stand there getting jiggled for three days. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, good question. Thank you. Now, on this question here, on this question here, I'm going to combine two people's questions. So Thomas uh, or Tomas asks a good question. I'd love to get your insights on how a recent parent think about fitness and health. Oh, man. Uh, I tell you, you can just look at my journals when the baby showed up and you can just see, and by the way, Thomas or, or Tomas, uh, in my, I learned more when Kelly and Lindsay were first born. I learned more about training then because I didn't have any time and I had to just be smarter than ever. So he, he, he talks about this. As you probably still have vivid in your mind, the poor sleep, brutal. Uh, carrying kids and the nagging aches that show up or make it harder to recover and even get the brain to train. Uh, he mentions being a little skinny fat father of two great kids. Uh, he always follows my advice. You crazy person. Um, I'm focusing on reducing fat and then some muscle and strength. Now, the reason I want to combine this question is because I'm going to give you and Luke basically the same answers. I do notice a lot of folks in the Q&A and forum posts are all about training for elite performance, which is great, but I'm just a regular guy wanting to be an all-rounder, never going to win an Olympic medal, and don't need to put up ridiculous numbers in the weight room. For someone who wants to be an all-around active person, 
one who'd like to go surfing, snowboarding. I love it and continue doing it until and the occasional cricket match. Yeah. I want to continue doing this until 80 or so. How would you approach your training? So in a sense, what I want to do is answer both your questions kind of at the same time. Because even though there are different needs, the, the concept's the same. You know, as the father of two, you, you, you want to stay in condition as long as you can. At least that's what I think with my babies. Um, and of course, the, and I, do, I do probably answer a lot of questions about elite performance at DJU, probably. Uh, I sometimes feel I don't, but you know, you, you know, you're, you're right. So the thing I came up with you and, and, and for you two, and I, and I invented this, and I'm going to sell this idea. This is a great idea. I've invented these. Uh, send me, send me $200 and I'll send you, I will send you these. Uh, this is just a, these are what, what are they called anyway? Uh, Note cards, I think they're called. Uh, yeah, that's what it says here. And what I like about this particular brand is that they stick, you know, which is nice, you know, uh, especially if you use them like I do for reminders. And what I did, so I have this pirate map that I follow every day. And this is my journal. This is my current journal. And uh, I like it. And this is my current pirate map. But, you know, this is a pirate map for a, you know, a 65 year old man who does weekend workshops and does some work online. I can wake up anytime I want most days. I don't because I go to bed so early. I wake up early and I have this great thing. You know, I do this, you know, I do these things every night and I do all this and you're all probably leaning in. Oh, what's your secret? Well, my secret is, you know, uh, you know, work, work, work really hard for, you know, I don't know, 50 plus years. And then, uh, Enjoy the benefits of it. So there's your plan. Well, that's in both cases, I want to address and help you as best I can. So what I thought would be a good idea is this. So I, I came up with I, what I consider a, a, a program for both of you. And I'd like my, my, my listeners to see if this has any value. First, so when I looked at this, I, I came up with some numbers. Okay, let me, so every night before you go to bed, I think you should have a to-do list for the next day. And one of the things I notice with myself anyway, if my to-do list says email Pavel, I just do it right there before I go to bed. If it says send a message to blank about blank, I'll just send a message to blank about blank. And so sometimes um, my to-do list isn't, I mean, some days, oh, this is today's, okay. Well, um, yeah, so today, I mean, I have a little note to myself and my to-do list is one thing today. One thing. So it's a pretty easy day. Now, there's other days that are tough. Uh, by the way, I also, I don't write down a lot of things like practice with my with my throwers is at noon every day. I don't need to write that down on my pirate map. That's just what I do. I don't necessarily write down everything I've got to do, especially with something I do every single day. Kind of like brushing your teeth. You know, I don't make a note to myself to brush my teeth. I sort of kind of remember it after, you know, a fairly long life of doing it. So what I'm going to recommend to you guys is this. First off, get yourself a pad of something. Uh, I like this note card. And before you go to bed, anytime you have any quiet time at night, write down the things you have to do tomorrow. Now, if you notice after a while you don't have very much, that's probably better. When I wake up, uh, I do a, I do a 15-minute meditation on an app called Brain.fm. But both of you are struggling for time. So what I have, what I would recommend, it's, it's an app called One Moment Meditation, OM. And it's on every, every app. And here's the upside. It's free. And it's a one-minute meditation. <clears throat> I press the button. The little man closes his eyes. And then it goes ping. And then for one minute, I count my breaths, Okay. <clears throat> now, I might be unique on this, but I find I find for myself that if I take five, six, or seven breaths, that's usually my better days. It's if Now, if I take 30 breaths in a minute, that's eh, probably a good day not to do anything. Oddly, I find if I'm like three or four, that doesn't always mean a good day either. I, I, I'm sure there's a good scientific reason for it, but I don't care. It's just something I've noticed. So... Writing down your to-do list before you go to bed, 
Zip. Uh, I don't know, 15 seconds. Your one minute meditation. Now, one of the things I do every day before I go to bed is I make a pot of coffee and I set it for the timer. However, I also do something my brother Gary taught me. I always keep instant coffee around. And then while you're doing, okay, you, you roll out, you, you do your, your arm, um, just, you know, before you do your morning pee pee, you, you flip on the, the kettle, the, I use an electron, uh, electric kettle here in the United States. We call them teapots. Um, flip that on. And by the time I kind of, you know, peruse around the house and making sure the doors are closed and stuff like that, the hot pot is hot. I take my instant coffee and I drop it in and I have my cup of coffee. It's far faster for me to do that than to make a whole pot of coffee. And there are many nights where I, when I, especially when I had little ones, that doing, making the pot of coffee would have been the thing that would have sent me over the edge. For your workout, do my one minute mobility thing. I, every day I hang for 30 seconds and then I sit at the bottom of a goblet squat for 30 seconds. That's my one minute mobility program. So one minute meditation, one minute mobility, instant coffee. And then I would do, if I were you, both for a while anyway, something along the lines of my perfect workout. So one minute mobility, the perfect workout takes me eight minutes. Now, if I walk, it'll take me longer. But so the, the perfect workout is uh, left hand, left knee down, eight half million presses. Right hand, right knee down, eight half kneeling presses, hang for 30 seconds again, drop down, left, right, hang, left, right, hang, three sets of eight in the presses and the extra hangs. Then I put on my glute loop and I do my hip thrusts. I do hip thrusts and clamshells. My favorite one in the mornings is 15 hip thrusts, 15 clamshells, 14, 14, 13, 13, all the way down to one, one. If that's all I get in the day, it's a good day. Then I do, I and get a broomstick and a weight. I use a kettlebell. You do a goblet squat. It's it's in it's it's in the YouTube's. I do a goblet squat. I put the weight down at the bottom. I pick up a stick. I stand up with an overhead squat. I go back down with that stick. I put the stick on the ground. I stand up with the goblet squat. That would be when I stand up with that goblet squat. That's one rep. Five is pretty good. Uh, I've done up to eight, but I find that the last three reps just get you tired. And then I march in place with that same kettlebell, uh, left and right hand suitcase carries. That workout takes me eight minutes, and I have a real-time example of it uh, on here on the YouTube channel. Um, I have one last piece of advice for you, but I want to think. I want you to think about this: one-minute meditation, instant coffee, one minute. Mobility, eight minute workout. That puts us at 11 minutes. And if you can't find 11 minutes in a day, and I, and I know sometimes you can't, but generally if you can't find 11 minutes in a day, we have some other issues we need to talk about. Uh, and then the final thing is, I think you should eat vegetables every meal. And I want you to model to your children that you eat vegetables every meal. So one of the things I do, and I, so I buy Pyrex over here at Smith's Food King. They have these little Pyrex assortments. I get nothing from any of this, you know. Uh, but they come in this size Pyrex, this size Pyrex, and this size, and there's the three lids. And I have three sets of those. But I always put my oatmeal, and I put my vegetables, and I put my... Now, my kimchi is in a glass jar, and I'm about to make the point here. So when I open up my fridge, I have... Any prepared foods I have, like I make my own sauerkraut, I put my diacon, uh, that's a, a, a yellow radish. Um, so when I open my fridge, I can see the vegetables. And this is important because you don't always have time. So about a week ago, my breakfast was this. I didn't have much time. I open up my fridge. I pulled out some salmon. I put the cold salmon on a plate. I added two different kinds of kimchi. I added my sauerkraut, which I have to make more of. I added diacon. I added my uh, overnight oats, which uh, are in a clear thing too. I did throw a little bit of yogurt on, uh, not very much. Blueberries. Oh, and then I have uh, sushi ginger in there. I threw that on too. 
And then I, I usually have those little oranges, the clementines that are big this time of year. Uh, and I usually have one of those with a meal like this. And it, it just explodes in color. But here's the thing. There's no cooking. And I threw everything on the plate in half a minute. And I was able to eat. So my advice to both of you is uh, long term, get that in first. So basically, get your veggies in because you can see them and you're just going to shovel them onto a plate. Get that at least that eight minute workout in. Get that in. And uh, if you have more time, that's when you walk out the door and you get your walk in. Boy, you'll love that after a few days. I can't tell you how much better I feel when I walk after my perfect workout. So, um, patent pending. Uh, uh, I do expect to, this will be the thing that makes me a trillionaire. Uh, so no one steal this idea, okay? Um, so that's kind of my advice, not only for a, a father trying to stay in shape, but for any of you who, who want to, to, to look good and feel good the rest of your life. You'll notice there's a blend there. I, I do talk about sleep hygiene. Uh, writing your to-do list before you go to bed is very healthy because you're, then you're not chasing your... And by the way, when I write, sometimes I even put down phone number, uh, the phone numbers of people I have to call or any information. I'll just stack it all right next to it so it's all right there. Uh, very often, I will highlight, like if I... Like to say this is something for the doctors. I'll, I mean, I'll... I'll highlight the phone number and I'll highlight something like that. Just so in the morning when I pick it up, it's just so much e easier. And the easier and easier make things, the easier it is to keep doing them. But so I've got sleep hygiene in there. I've got meditation in there. Uh, I like to start my day with uh, freeing up my free fatty asses by drinking coffee. I've got mobility in there. I've got a gentle, nice overall body workout. I emphasize vegetables and... Um, you can see them because they're in Pyrex or uh, mason jars. Oh, mason jars. Those, the mason jars that are this big are probably the, the healthy person's best friend. Uh, yes, I make my sauerkraut there. Yes, that's why. But using that to store your food, when you come home from the, when you come home from the store and you do the work, I, I think you should chop and dice. You just shove that right in those mason jars so you can see what you have in there. Uh, it works great for fruit. It works great for, uh, now there are, t there are some that you, you, you don't want to store with the lid tight and, but I, I always, you know, I always put the lids on everything, but so those are my ideas. Uh, I think there's some value to them. Um, I have been there. Uh, I trained at a fairly high level, but you'll notice in my athletic career, there was a big dip. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't with Kelly. I was my best years as a lifter was 91 when Kelly was one. She'd go to meets and she was darling. Uh, and there's nothing as Lindsay, but when we had two little ones, uh, things got very difficult. Interesting, by 1996, and you can watch that video of John Powell and me coaching, John Powell coaching me in 1996. Um, I was kind of back up. It, so when the girls were two and four, uh, my life got radically easier, of course. When they went to the same school, my life got even easier. And of course, then it got real easy when they could drive themselves to their friends' houses. That made my life much easier. So, uh, and then of course, you have all the other issues. You're worried about them doing something uh, stupid. But they didn't, they were good kids. Hope that helps, hope that helps. Wow, I really enjoyed the questions this week. Um, um, I think I think I like this idea of about uh, printing off the questions. Um, I, I always read the questions beforehand, but just the simple act of printing them out and seeing them in a different uh, format seemed to really help my mind get a little stimulated. Well, listen, if you want to stimulate my mind, just send your questions here to podcast uh, at danjohnuniversity.com. I'll do my best to answer each and every one. And as I always say, until next time, let's all keep on lifting and learning. Thank you.